I think of the last ones of Woody, Woody Guthrie's song, Pretty Boy Floyd, and they go like this. As, I've, as around the world I've rambled, I've seen a lot of funny men. Some of you with a six gun, and some with a thousand ten. So, Casa. Casa is shorthand for the committee, the committee to house the Bay Area. The project the Metropolitan Transportation Committee. Now you might be wondering, why is the Metropolitan, why is the transportation agency getting involved with housing? And the answer to that question is really important in terms of understanding what we're up against and what it's going to, what's going to be involved in fighting it. Every major region in California has what's called a Metropolitan Planning Organization, MPO. It's a federally designated agency that's responsible for funneling federal transportation dollars to its region. In our region, MTC is the MPO. It's a state agency. It's created by the California legislature in 1971, also to funnel state transportation funds to the Bay Area. It also oversees the, the bridge tolls for all the bridges in the Bay Area, except the Golden Gate. The upshot of all this is that it's rich, it's powerful, and it's greatly feared. It's also a profligate road agency. In 2010, MTC lost $120 million in bridge tolls on credit swaps gone bad. It still has a couple of billion dollars in variable bonds. The, um, Figure the cost of the two pallets, its headquarters on Real Street in San Francisco, $90 million cost overrun. It also had a major hand in the Bay Bridge debacle. Its board is dominated by uh, the three largest cities in the region. Every major region in California also has a, a land use planning agency, known as the Council of Governments, COP for short. The Bay Area, ours is ABAC. Unlike MTC, ABAC is a voluntary association that was created, I think, in 1961 by the cities and counties of the Bay Area. It's poor. And um, ABAC, and so in every other region, the um, MPO is subordinate to the COP. It is different in the Bay Area. Until 2016, MTC and ABAC coexisted in kind of an uneasy cohabitation. Literally, they lived in the same building. They still do. It's a different building near Lake Merritt. And what happened, what changed things was SB 375, the Sustainable Communities and Climate Protection Act of 2008. That law, state law, requires each region to prepare a sustainable community strategy. Ours is the Plan Bay Area. And that meant that the two agencies had to work together closely for the first time. That collaboration engendered conflict and tension, partly over money, it is dependent on MTC for a lot of money, and partly over policy. And the upshot was that um, in 2016, MTC engineered a hostile takeover of ABAC. Pat Eklund led the good fight at ABAC, trying to defeat that. But the cities of the Bay Area are, I hope this is not still true, but there were at least two fragments that <coughs> successfully resist. A very dramatic fight, I wrote thousands of words about it, cities lost. So now there's a single um, staff. Um, MTC Executive Director Steve Cominger is the Executive Director for ABAC. There's some governance issues, I don't have time to get it now. I mean, it's still formally separate, but MTC is running the show. That takeover signaled MTC's ambition to become a one-stop regional transportation and land use agency. And the CASA Compact is a major step in that transformation. MTC has said, and it's in the compact, that what's in the, the policies in the compact are going to be incorporated into Plan Bay Area 2050, which is going to be finalized in 2021. Okay, so. And the arena is also, right. And, and that, that's, yeah. Um, I brought a copy of the uh, roster, the membership, I want it back, please, um, of CASA. Who is it? So in uh, June 2017, MTC convened CASA. And the roster is comprised of 53 handpicked, secretly, handpicked individuals, handpicked by MTC, dominated by the real estate industry. Uh, let's see, I'm using my notes here. 
They're representatives of major, both market rate and affordable housing builders, big ones, um, obviously they're major in the region, as well as the California Apartment Association, that's apartment owners, the Building Industry Association, pro-growth affordable housing advocates, think tanks, Spur, and BART. The 12, this is going to be a little bit like uh, the Republicans of Christmas, but, and I'm not going to cover everything, so you might want to look at the, the last ones that go together. There are 12 local officials, half of whom come from the biggest cities in the region. There are two token environmentalist groups, Greenbelt Alliance and Transform. Big Tech, Google, and Facebook, and Big Philanthropy also have seats at the table. Big Philanthropy, I mean the San Francisco Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. There are three equity advocates, Pico California, that's a faith-based organization, Urban Habitat, and Working Partnership USA, which works a lot with um, low-income employees of, of Silicon Valley, big Silicon Valley. Organized labor has three seats, two from the building trades, um, the Alameda County Building Council, and the Carpenter Union in Northern California, and um, SEIU, Hospital Workers Union. They've been pretty quiet. But the building trades people have not been quiet, and they are not, are not happy with this compact. Two um, avid opponents of the California Environmental Quality Act, Attorney General uh, Hernandez, and the representative from Habitat for Humanity. Yes, folks, Habitat Humanity hates the California Environmental Quality Act. Anybody who remembers the city can tell you why. And one genuine tenants advocate, there's a woman from Tenants Together, the uh, equity advocates regionally got together and kind of forced them to see and put her on the, um, the roster. They've been meeting for a year and a half. Um, the two committees, the technical committee, which is larger, has had mostly monthly meetings, but it's had a lot of secret private meetings. And how do I know that they happen if they're secret? Because they talk about them in retrospect. We worked our butts off, and this is literally our last week in our, 30 people worked for, met for six hours yesterday, and then they work on weekends and nights. The um, steering committee is like maybe four times the regularly it meets in public. I um, asked the First Amendment Coalition at these secret meetings also, except for the first meeting, there are no minutes. Um, they wised up after the first meeting, I guess. There are video recordings. One meeting, there's only audio. So I contacted the First Amendment Coalition and I said, is this legal? And what I was told, they said, reluctantly, we have to tell you, it is legal. Why? Because CASA is not an official um, legislative or judicial body, so it doesn't fall under the Brown Act. So they've been working very, very hard. Um, but mind you, they've got incredible support from MTC. They meet for free in their building. They have massive technical support. I mean, if you can see the files I have, because I've either gone to the meetings or created out the agendas, it's like, whoa. And a bevy of consultants. And this is one particularly juicy fact that I like about CASA. <coughs> In January, MTC signed a contract with the um, consultancy of co-owned by Jennifer Lassar. Jennifer Lassar is the wife of Tony Atkins. Tony Atkins is the president pro tem of the California Senate. MTC signed a contract with her business for $150,000. Can you spell conflict of interest? No. Mm -hmm. Corruption. And these two women have been criticized plenty in San Diego for their connections. Okay. Um, so what did they produce? This is it. This is the latest edition. Um, the Cossack Compact. Um, it's self-described as 15-year emergency policy package to confront the housing crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. The stated goals, they frame it around what they call the three P's. Um, the production of housing, the preservation of affordable housing, and the protection of tenants' rights. The actual goals, my reading, to preempt local land use authority in behalf of limitless growth and government for and by big business. The compact proposes to create a new independent, that's their term, public-private, um, region-wide agency that will have the authority to issue debt, levy, collect, and disperse taxes, buy and sell land, and impose zoning standards across the region. Everybody gets the same thing. It will be run by a board with the same makeup as CASA. In other words, it will be dominated by the real estate industry. Now, there are people, including myself, who say, who object to ABAC and MTC. Uh, ABAC is a little better than MTC, not much. 
Why? Because the people who sit on its boards are not elected to those to, to serve on the regional level. They're, they're council members and um, supervisors, county supervisors. The CASA board is going to be dominated by people who aren't elected to anything. <laughs> they're private individuals who represent the interests that, I mean, Hemminger said, the same makeup as the safety calls of the stakeholders as the people on the roster. I don't know where that this is, but you can take a look at that. Okay, also the fees are not equal. Production gets the line, is designated for the lion's share of money and uh, for major policy punches. Let's talk about the money. The estimated cost is two and a half billion dollars. They never quite come out with that until now. So we've been talking about the one and a half billion. One billion of that is coming from, it's helping, unspecified federal and state uh, sources. I have Aquarian to MTC asking, what are those? The other one and a half billion is coming from um, what they're calling regional, and I love this here, local self-help measures. <laughs> so the San Francisco Business Times had um, an article I subscribed to that on December 7th called, Who Will Pay? Who Will Pay? Just if it's about us. Just about everyone. Okay, so how do they break that down? I'm going to give you the breakdown. Five hundred million dollars. They say everyone. What is that? A quarter cent sales tax, regional, and bond obligations. Two hundred million from property owners, taxes on vacant housing and parcel taxes. Four hundred million from governments in the nine county um, Bay Area, and specifically revenue sharing from future property tax growth, redevelopment revenue set aside and public land set aside. I'm not sure what public land set aside means, but that's what they say. Sounds like sales. Well, they are. We'll, we'll get, I mean, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then the allocation formula. A minimum of 60% for subsidized housing production, up to 10% for tenant protection services, up to 10% for local jurisdictions, this is again the quotes, local jurisdiction incentives, including funding for hiring more building inspectors, which I would put in production, but okay. And up to 20% for affordable housing. Now note that uh, only production comes with a funding floor. The tenant protection and the pr uh, preservation of affordable housing has its ambiguous um, ceiling up to. In other words, it could be less. The policies. Okay, so I printed out the policies in the compact. Here they are with my little notes. No way can we get into them. Can I get into them right now? Um, I'm going to give you my thumbnail summaries and red flags. The basic approach here is based on a lot of elaborate, let's call it fabrication. The area housing crisis is woes. I hate to play the way I put my problem with that phrase, the area housing crisis. These, I mean, they're obviously real problems. But what, the way that phrase is being used is as soon as someone says there's a, there's a housing crisis, you're supposed to salute whatever comes afterward without considering, okay, what? So I try not to use it. Um, so three groups. One, selfish homeowners who don't want growth in their neighborhoods. Two, cities that refuse to build housing. Excuse me, cities do not build housing. Three, odorous local zoning laws that reflect that refusal and that selfishness. So what's the solution? So plant local land use authority with a regional agency run by and for big business and throw a few stops to tenants. So let's go through the 10 elements of CASA. Not to be confused with the 10 commandments. What are what? <laughs> Just cause eviction policy. And these are my assessments. You might have not agree with them. I think it's good. But why limit it to the Bay Area? To a rent cap. They want to cap um, rent increases at the um, the CPI plus 5% in any year of tenancy. And it's just way to address it. The big landlord can live with that happily. And um, plus, for three to five years, landlords get to bank tenant increase, the, the, the increases they did take, and then they can take them later. <laughs> uh, I think a, a maximum of 10 to 15% a year. Three, emergency rent assistance and access to legal counsel. Again, it's a great idea, but why limit it to the Bay Area to come to, to be a state mandate? Four, remove regulatory barriers to accessory dwelling units of the grand class um, accessory building as AB units. So there's already, last year, SB 1069 and AB 2890. Last week, three, or this past week, three new bills were introduced that would loosen regulations on ABUs further. 
then we come to what are really, uh, which is really the meat of this thing. Minimum zoning year transit. So this is a makeover, a do-over of SBA 27 and SB 50, which has already been mentioned. What they're trying to do, this may be obvious to most of you or all of you, they're trying to break up the coalition that killed SBA 27. They're trying to peel off the, um, the tenants, advocates, and the low-income folks, the, the latest you can really live in sensitive communities, <laughs> um, peel that off and demonize um, the emergency single family homes. Um, and the way they're doing that is uh, the, the language that's used at um, CASA, and I have to say, I mean, the path that Pat went to all those meetings, I've either gone to them or watched them, oh my god. But it's really important to watch them because that's where they say what they really believe. The language is used is we need to break open exclusionary neighborhoods. We need to unlock those neighborhoods. Right? That's the language. And this they were saying the day after SBA 27 passed, somebody even called single family neighborhoods that beast. And how are they going to do it? I mean, this is they're, they're so candid when they're there. Messaging. That what's our messaging? And the messaging is that we're in support of diversity and inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And people who want to defend single family neighborhoods are racist, elitist, selfish, the rest of it. You heard it, but it's out there again. The other thing they're doing is throwing a stop to the so-called sensitive communities by saying that they can defer the upzoning um, in SB 50. Uh, the compact says for three years. I can't remember, and then they can't, and then, then it comes. And one of my colleagues and uh, buddies in Berkeley, she's on Berkeley House Advisory Commission, said basically, this is red line. No investment allowed in those poor communities for those years. And then, and, and, and developers can bank the land um, in that time. And then and then out and the zoning goes up, and in the meantime, people are going to be, we'll, we'll see. Zoning goes up, uh, inflated um, real estate values. What else do I want to tell you about that? OK, that's enough for now. Number six, good government reforms to housing approval process. This involves, among other things, I'm going to summarize it, locking in the rules for any project upon the completed submission of an application to the city for that project. The city can't change the rules after the application has been completed and submitted to the city. Seven, um, expedited approvals and financial incentives for select housing. So they, this is a, um, an expansion of SB 35. Well, let's say it's not, but it could be an admission SB 35. It's not additive. But it is, because they're saying that what they're calling missile, missing middle housing is now going to be eligible for the exemptions, including the CEQA exemptions that are in SB 35. What is missing middle housing? 80 to 150% of area median income with an average affordability of 110%. In um, 2018, in San Francisco, San Mateo, and Marin counties, uh, let's see what I've got here, the 110% AMI for a family of four, that is the household income, is $130,250. So this is lowering affordability requirements. And they've said a lot. We have to build great, solve the housing crisis is to build housing um, at all levels of income. And I don't agree. That's the mantra. Then um, un un unlock public land for affordable housing. <laughs> Where this, uh, that's an unlock, as if it's somehow being held illicit in an illicit manner. This is basically the privatization of irreplaceable public assets once they're gone forget it. Um, and they want to also to authorize building mixed income. That means, again, in housing at all income levels on this land. And then 10, the regional housing uh, funding across the compact. I've mentioned that in some detail. And then the regional housing enterprise. So what's the timeline? On Monday, the um, CASA uh, technical committee approved uh, the compact. On uh, next Wednesday, the 12th, uh, the steering committee, which really doesn't steer, uh, will have a big contact on its agenda. I'm sure they're going to approve it. On um, December 19th, MTC meets. The contact will again be on its agenda, uh, on the agenda. And then on January 17th, the ABEC executive board will meet and will consider CASA. But the wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, outrageous, uh, Hemager told 
told the ABAG executive board on November 15th, after he got some real pushback, it was amazing to me. I sat there, I wasn't there, but I watched the video. My mouth gaped. I couldn't believe it. Um, real hostility, including from Dave Cortese, of all people, Santa Clara County. But we can go into that later if you want in um, the discussion. Um, amazing. <laughs> and so <laughs> one of the reps said, well, what if we don't approve it? it not quite that baldly as I'm putting it. And he just said, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if CASA, if ABEC doesn't approve it, doesn't matter if MTC doesn't approve it. It was shocking. And I will, he didn't say this, but I will. MTC has given CASA hundreds of thousands of public dollars <coughs> and support. What can we do? We had to let these people run. And that's where you run, right? They own their project, their product. People, this ought to be a scandal. And it should be, it will be a scandal, I think, when people find out about it. So right, so why why are they doing it like this? Because this um, sort of package, the cost of compact, it's a legislative package. They can't move forward with it unless they need state laws to authorize the creation of the regional the um, regional governmental enterprise and call it an agency that they're calling it a regional housing enterprise. They need the state legislature to authorize the creation of that thing and the revenue sources that will be needed to fund it. So another one in their mind, there's just something, I'm trying to be polite, sort of disingenuous. The compact is a compact, right? I mean, again, all the elements have to move together, forward together. Well, that's nonsense. I mean, the draft of SB 50 is in the compact. So it's already out. So obviously, they're moving forward, moving the production stuff already. And that's something that some of the equity advocates complained about um, in November. But they need they need all this stuff. So they want, some people said it be the executive board, well, what's the rush? Well, the rush is <laughs> the legislative session has opened for the, for the new year, the new legislative session. And their timeline calls for the policies in the compact to be enacted into state law in 2019. 2020, presidential election. Big turnout. I'm just telling you what, what Kevin Turner says. Ballot measure. Ballot measure. Mega is the term. Mega ballot <coughs> measure in the Ninth County um, region for transportation and housing. Sir, right? Am I a Democratic Housing Chief? You could sort of right. call me on this if I'm not if yeah. being accurate. Um, and then um, 2000, so that's 2019, 2020, in the election. Um, maybe bond measure. It's not clear. I mean, there's a great, uh, Stephen Essel uh, clipped a great. Uh, comment from Heminger uh, at one of the meetings where he says, I'm going to paraphrase slightly, there's no way we could put, he's looking at all the, the menu of the funding office, there's no way we could put all these suckers, that's his term, all these suckers on one ballot and get them passed. <laughs> it's like, dude. Um, and so, um, and he also said, so it, it's going to be important for us to uh, go to the voters as little as possible. Okay. And then they also, so 2021, incorporate the compact into Plan BRA 2050 and new readings. And then 2022, they've got it on their timeline, but they haven't specified what's going to happen. It will depend on what they can accomplish up to there. So what is to be done? This is a travesty of public policy making. And for the sake of local democracy and a truly liberal uh, Bay Area, it needs to be stopped. The fact that it's going to be passed by state legislation, these laws complicates things because there are lots of state laws, however, that they're going to put forward. The compact provides a focus, I think. And this is all to be discussed. I'm just telling you what I think. So what is to be done? Same old, same old. Educate and then mobilize. Most people, including most public officials, have no idea what's coming there. Yeah. And what gives me a bit of hope, this is what I'm going to close on, is that the results of a survey that they took um, between, they didn't take it, but they had a poll, a poll uh, it was 900 registered voters in Alameda, Contra Costa, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and San, um, San Francisco County. Sorry, my people, you know, great, but we don't have. And the compact has an allusion to the results, which misreports what they, what they are. It says, uh, when Bay Area residents are polled about who's responsible for the housing crisis, they spread the blame far and wide. Uh, not exactly. So when people were asked what the major factor is, 57% developers who are trying to maximize profit rather than build the people want to meet. Excuse me? Uh, that language, I'm sure, was presented to the, uh, the respondents. But still, 
The next, I'm giving you the top three. 48% technology companies who have jobs mm -hmm. in the region. Now, 38% local governments who are opposing housing developments. So, the top one is, the top is um, I already forgot it. <laughs> developments. But the hype is getting out there that the problem is um, local government as well. So, there's hope. You have your work cut out for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>